Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Stephen Gort and I want to thank you for joining with me today. Today we get to continue our series in the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verse 42 to 47. Probably some verses that you know really, really well, but we'll get to those in just a little while. Now, one of the things that I loved uh, grow, watching my children grow up was how they would relate to the people around them. And it was great watching them when they were at preschool because you'd have a group of preschool children playing together. Well, that's what it looked like. Actually, what you had was a group of people and each little child was playing their own game. It looked like they were playing together. It looked like a group but they were actually just all individual playing. A group of individuals. As uh, my children have got older and now they are teenagers, it's interesting because even though it's 10 or more years on since their preschool days, I actually get to see the same thing. Let me explain. You could have a group of teenagers together. They could be sitting in a group and they're all on their phones. So instead of talking and relating to each other verbally, eye contact, all of that, they might even be using their phones to text or, snap, text or Snapchat to someone else just across the group, you know, two metres away. But they still might be doing it that way. A group, but a group of individuals. Have you ever seen that? Maybe have you ever done that yourself? Now I think in our society today, our society praises being an individual. It praises individualism. We, it tells you, look out for number one. Or the ad that used to be on TV. The most important person in the world is you. You're the most important person in the world. Frank Sinatra's, one of his greatest songs, which if you wanted a theme song, I think for our society could be his, and that is, I do it my way. Now, don't we praise individualism? Don't we pat people on the back who are good at doing things by themselves? Yeah, I think we do. I think we praise it. And when you look at our world, it's very obvious that it happens. You can see that people are so busy with their work or their lives, they don't often have the time or they don't take the time to stop and communicate face to face with people. When was the last time you did that? Now I know, yes, COVID-19 has changed things and made things very difficult. But when was the last time you just sat down and took some time to get to know somebody else? Some of us might be trying to think, oh, that might have been a little while ago. And yes, it is harder. But it is something that we need to think about. Because I think our world keeps pushing us towards being individuals. Today, we can work from home. We can communicate from home. We can be educated from home. So much so that if it wasn't for Zoom meetings where you might be face to face with someone, that you can go through much of life without ever having to communicate with someone face to face physically. Now, COVID-19, I think, has exacerbated that. We are a society that praises the individual. But is that the way it's supposed to be? from day dot, from creation. Is that the way it should have been? I want us to think about that today because I want us to think not just big picture, society, but bring it into the church. Do we in our church actually praise being the individual? Now, before COVID-19 hit, the fastest growing churches in the world were TV churches, were online, internet churches, places like churchforall.org or cyberchurch.com, cyberchurch.org. They were the fastest growing churches because people could just log in, jump on the internet, have a look, and then leave whenever they want. Maybe you got a bit of music, maybe you got a, a message or someone explaining the Bible. However much it was, you got to make the choice what you wanted. Did you want the lot? Or did you think, yeah, that sermon's not for me? So you quit part way through. You could just turn it off whenever you want it. Is that the way church is supposed to be? 
Now, you might be thinking, hey, Stephen, I actually like that idea. I love it. I could uh, hear a sermon when I don't want it or when I'm starting to switch off, turn it off and get straight to the football or something else. Maybe you're wondering, what are those actual web addresses that maybe we can do it again? Or think about COVID-19. We have been putting our sermons up on the YouTube channel, Casino Baptist Church, the YouTube channel, so that people who are worried about coming or people who, if we have too many physically to meet in our building or for other reasons, away on holidays or, or whatever it might be, people have been at home and watching this on YouTube. It's been brilliant. I am praise God that we've had this opportunity. But the interesting thing is I've heard from some people and they've said, Stephen, I love it. I love it because I can sit at home, lean back, sit in my pyjamas and I don't have to face meeting anyone face to face. Is that really what church is supposed to be like? And I wonder in this individualistic society whether the church is becoming a group of individuals. Even when people come physically into the building, I wonder if we're still a group of individuals. I wonder if some people just come and think, right, I've walked in the door, I've sat down, I'm not going to talk to anyone, I'm not going to look to the left, I'm not going to look to the right, I'm not going to look at people, I'm not going to start up a conversation, uh, maybe I can look around the room and see if someone needs something, but no, 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 it's all right, someone else will take care of it, I don't need to do it, I've just got to come for what I want, I want church my way, I'll just sit here, I'll get it, and then once I've got it, I'll get up and leave. And actually, if I don't get what I want, then I will leave and I probably won't come back. Or I'll go look for somewhere else so that I can still try to find something so I can get it my way. Have you heard of people doing that? Have we actually ever done that? Have we ever done that you know, in our church? Have we started to be individuals even though we meet as a group? Has individualism crept into our church? And is that the way it should be? Well, I, I think the answer is yes, it has crept in. You know, some people, I saw this t-shirt during the week and some people might really agree with it. It says, Galileo was wrong. I really am the center of the universe. I think people both inside and outside the church have swallowed that. We praise individualism. The church praises the individualism. But is that the way it's supposed to be? Because I think the Bible very clearly, right from creation, screams out the exact opposite. We're not meant to be individuals. We are meant to be community. We are meant to be in relationship with God and with each other. We're supposed to relate to God, to love God, to follow God, to commune with God. It's that picture of community, communing together, and to do that with one another. The, I think the Bible very clearly says yeah, no to being an individual, but yes to being part of community. And when we come to look at uh, Acts chapter 2, today, verse 42 to 47, when we look at the early church, I think they scream out very, very clearly no to being an individual and yes to being community. So let's look at those verses. If you've got your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. In verse 42 we read, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. I just want to focus first on that picture of fellowship. This group of people, they came together and they loved together. Yeah? The word mentioned in the Greek here is koinos. Yeah? The picture of where uh, we get koinonia from. It, it's where we get uh, this idea of Christian fellowship. And the translation here from the NIV even uses that word, Christian fellowship. But what does that mean? Now, I think sometimes we might think fellowship means get together for a meal after the morning service, talking at morning tea, yeah, doing something like that, doing a church picnic. That's fellowship. But the picture here is something so much more. When you look at this word and unpack what it meant for the Greek people, there's this picture that it means a sharer, a companion, one who is a partaker, a participant in communion. Yeah, It means love together. And it was often used in early Greek literature to talk about Siamese twins, that they shared 
the same blood system. That's the word here. Fellowship means to share the same blood system, to be that sharer, that companion, that partaker, so closely knitted to someone else that you know them, that you know their needs, that you're a part of their life. That is the bigger picture of what fellowship means. And in the first century church, when this church was just beginning, you could see why they needed it. Because if you were a Christian, then you are persecuted by the Jews. If you were someone who says you follow Jesus, you are persecuted by the Romans. You could lose your job, you could lose your house. You might end up on the street begging and looking for help from people. You were persecuted, even put to death. Most of the disciples in the end were put to death because they said they loved and followed Jesus. So for the early church, this was a challenging time. They were being persecuted hugely and they needed to do this. They needed to love together. They needed to fellowship. They needed to do this so that they could survive. Now, you might say today, yeah, we don't face that sort of persecution today, Stephen. So do we actually need this type of fellowship, this sharing of blood, this partaking, this sharing, this companioning, this closeness? Do we really need it in our church? Well, I believe we do. I believe we need to recapture this same, of, same type of fellowship that the early church had. Yeah? It means that I'm willing to open my life to you, that I'm willing to share. I'm willing to share with you and partake in your life, that I get to understand who you are and your needs, and you get to understand who I am and my needs. And yes, I'll be very clear and honest about it. This is scary. Yeah, I'm not so good, personally, at opening myself. I'm not so good at asking for help. And maybe you're not either. But the picture here is that we get to know each other so well that we share the same blood. So, do you have that same fellowship that this early church had? Do you have it with the people around you today? Can you say that you share blood with them? Yeah, this early church, they did. They learnt the scriptures together. When you read through these verses, they ate together. They prayed together. They met daily. They did it all together. It was a focus for them to meet together. And I think, you know, when we've been going through COVID-19, one of the reasons why, uh, not just for myself, uh, but for the church leaders, we have been wanting to do everything we can. And yes, church may not look like we used to do church, but we want to do everything we can to meet together so we can do this, so we can have this fellowship, so we can love together. So we've done the health orders and done the plans and, and done a whole lot of other things so we can actually do this together. Now, when I talk here of breaking of bread, uh, they could be mean just a normal meal or they might be talking about communion. They didn't really make the distinction that we do today because they would regularly uh, eat together and then at the end of the meal, take communion. Now the mo main point when you think of reading the scriptures, eating together, praying together, meeting together daily, they did it all together. That's the point here. They could have sat at home in their own little house in the privacy and the quietness, sat there in their pajamas, and they could have enjoyed church. They could have done all of this themselves. They could have done it all as an individual, but they didn't. For them, the focus, for them, the priority. Yes, we're going to do these things, but we're going to do them together. Now notice here they also sold all their uh, possessions and then shared what they had around with people. Now it's obvious, uh, the obvious question is when you read through these verses, should we be doing exactly the same thing? Now remember their situation, they were being persecuted, people had lost their homes, their jobs, uh, they had to beg, a whole lot of other things. They believed everything they had belonged to God and that God would, uh, that one way that God would use it was to help everyone together. So they sold things. Now, does that mean we should do the same? Is it wrong to actually own a house? Is it wrong to own, for some people, might even have holiday homes? Is it wrong to have multiple cars? Is it wrong? Well, the answer is no. I think of someone else, uh, another couple in scripture, Ananiah and Sapphira. Now, think about them. Uh, did they get in trouble because they owned property? No, they didn't. Did they get in trouble because they sold it and got money? No, they didn't. 
They got in trouble from God because they tried to cheat God and they tried to lie to God. Now, having possessions and things like that, it is not wrong. But we need to remember it all comes from God. It all belongs to God. So what we should pray is, God, how can I use what you have given me for your kingdom? Now, if we pray that, I wonder, when was the last time that maybe you did pray that? Did I pray? If that's what we should be praying and asking God that question, it may actually be, the answer might be, sell everything and give to others. But often, it may not be as well. But remember, what we have is not ours, it's God. And because it's God's, and because church is God's people gathering together, then maybe we need to use it in a better way to help each other. So for the early church, one of the first things they did as community is that they loved together. Now, fellowship was so important for them because it helped them face their persecution. It helped them to face life. And I don't think anything has changed. I think we need this fellowship in our church today so we can encourage one another, we can support one another, we can be there in life's journey together through this time. Whether it's COVID-19 or just general life, we need to do this together. So I think the picture here of the early church and how they loved together is something that we need to do. Now, do you see this idea of fellowship? Do you see how loving one another, it's anti-individualism, isn't it? It's not about being an individual. It's not about doing what you want. It's about the community. So I want us to be thinking about that this week. Now, fellowship says to us, it's not what I want, but it's what the group wants. Now, in the church sense, it could be, yeah, maybe there's a musical instrument, maybe there's a song, maybe there's a singer or a church leader or a ministry or something that church does that you don't really like. And maybe for some people at the moment, because we've had to change things from how we used to do church because of COVID-19, maybe you're a bit sad about how church is going at the moment and you wish that things could change. Well, in this sort of situation, the question isn't about, shouldn't be, what do I want? What is best for me? It should be, what does God want for his church in this local place? So that's why I've given you two questions to think about. The first question is, what do I expect of the church? So I want you just to think for a moment. What do you expect from the church? So either you can write something down if you want or just to think about it. So that's the first question. Because when we come to fellowship, that's not the question I think we need to be asking. The second question is, what should this church expect from me? What should this church expect from me? Do you see how those questions are different? The first, what am I going to get from it? The second What should the greater group, what should God and his kingdom, the greater group, the community, what should they expect from me? So you got some answers for those two questions? Well, this is what I want you to do. Question one, what do you expect from the church? If you wrote it down or do something like that, or it's just up in your mind, figuratively take that answer and just let it blow away. This week, today, I want us to focus on the second one. I want you to answer the question, what does the church expect from you? And I want you to pray and ask God to think about how you can answer that question and then do it. The first question is about being the individual. Now we could have a group of people here at church today and all are individual. But I don't think that's scripture. That's not community. That's not loving together. So this week, think about what you can do for the church. So that's the first way. The second way what this church does is they learn together. And back to verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. I think to be an essential, healthy church that loves one another, that supports and encourages one another, we have to do it around a great foundation. And that foundation is God's word. 
For this early church, it was the apostles' teaching. It was letters that were passed around from the churches. It was their understanding of the Old Testament and Jesus' teaching. We have so much more. We have the whole Bible, and we need to be in it. We need to be learning from it. We need to let it, as we looked at last week, to change our lives. Yeah, the picture here of being devoted, it says they devoted themselves to. It means being in close contact with, continuing in. They delved into scriptures daily as a community. They didn't sit at home, just do it by themselves. They took whatever opportunity it was to do it together. They shared it together. They learned from it together and how they could live it out. You got it together. It wasn't about being the individual. It was about doing together. For a community to grow, they needed that, those strong roots. They needed that strong foundation. And it begins and is built upon understanding God's word. Now, they loved together. They learnt God's word together. So I encourage you, keep coming to church if you can make it physically. If you can't, keep watching uh, on the YouTube channel. And be willing to call and ask questions if something comes up. Uh, 6.30 on a Wednesday evening, most weeks we're doing Facebook Live. Come along, ask some questions there. Casino Baptist Church, uh, our Facebook page. And we can be learning together at that point. We can be studying and asking questions about God's word to help us as a community to learn what God wants us to do. And if the Bible is filled with how to live God's way and it's about relationship and it's about community, it's about following him and then how we relate to one another, if it's in the God's word, and it is, then we need to be in it. We need to be reading it. We need to be studying it. And we need to apply it. And they did. And it was very obvious that they did. Because the third part I just want to touch on today for this early church, they didn't just love together, they didn't just learn together, but they evangelized together. Now, when you read through the book of Acts, and we'll get through the whole book eventually, you, know, you don't see it as a certain person. It was just their job to go and share Jesus with people. It wasn't just the church leaders that did. It wasn't a committee. It wasn't uh, something like that. It was something that they all did. For the moment they became believers and they joined together as a group of people calling themselves Christians, saying that they loved and followed Jesus, they shared that message verbally. They shared it as they lived their life with the people around. Can you imagine in that community, if you had a group of people that sold everything and shared so that everyone was looked out for, could you imagine the impact that, that would have in that community? I reckon that people would come to them and say, we want to know what you know. And they wanted to learn about Jesus. Now evangelism, it, it wasn't an event. It wasn't a specific function or anything like that. They just lived out their life. They read the scriptures together and they lived it out. As they loved each other, they loved God in community. They lived for God and people came to faith. We see that down in verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I wonder today, do we follow their example? Can people look at our lives and see our faith? Do they look at our community? Do they look at Casino Baptist Church and say, that's a great place where people love each other, love God and serve their community? People see that in us. If maybe today you're not part of our local community, in the community where you live, can people look at you and say, yes, we're a community. We love each other. We learn the scriptures. And we reach out and share Jesus with people. Can they see that in your community? Now today, it's about being the individual. That's what society says. You're the most important person. And you can go to church and be an individual. You can stay at home and be an individual. But that's not the Acts 2 church. Now, I, I was thinking earlier about asking the question, when you think of the online, when you think of the internet church and all of that, is that real church? I think Acts 2 says no. Now, you don't get that face-to-face -face communication 
you don't get people having to leave their homes and being able to communicate and look out for each other. Maybe you're someone who's sitting there today and says, Steve, look, oh, yeah, I don't need to do that face-to-face physically. Yeah, I'm someone who's wonderful on social media. I can thumb tap with the best of them and I can reach people. And people can do that. And that is a ministry. But is that the same picture that Acts 2 is talking about here? Is that the same picture of fellowship and loving together? Is it the same picture of learning the scriptures together? Is it really the same picture of evangelizing together? Is that the way church should solely be? I think Acts 2 gives us another picture. I think Acts 2 really asks other questions. And that's why today I gave you well the title of this sermon is Do We Pass the Casserole Test? Now, you might think that's a bit of a strange question. Do we pass the casserole test? Well, I'm asking, does the internet pass the casserole test? In other words, uh, when life is not going well for you, maybe it's a health issue, maybe you've had a new baby, maybe uh, financially, life is a struggle, or you're having uh, some mental challenges at the moment. When that happens, can the internet knock on your door, open it, and say, here's a casserole. I've been thinking about you. I've been praying for you. Do you need a chat? Can I help you? Can the internet do that? In the early church in Acts 2, that's what they did for each other. That's why I think I could say they passed the casserole test. I wonder if the internet does that today. I wonder if social media does that. I wonder, do we at Casino Baptist Church physically do that? And do we pass the casserole test? When we look at our church family, are there people who are slipping through the cracks? Now, I know over the years there have been some challenges in this place. And have we just let people stop coming have we stopped relating to those people have we not cared at the moment about them is that passing the casserole test i think acts 2 gives a different answer so today as we think about acts 2 42 to 47 when we think about what it means to be the church god's people together Do we love together? Do we have that fellowship where we can say, when I look around our church, we share blood together. We know each other so well that we share blood. Do we learn the scriptures together? Are we getting into home groups together? Are we listening to sermons together? Are we meeting physically and then challenging ourselves about talking about scripture together? Do we live a life that matches what we read? And so therefore, through what we say and through how we live, we evangelize together. So today, here at Casino Baptist Church, do we pass the casserole test? For you, wherever you might be today, do you, your church, pass the casserole test? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you your word i thank you for the challenge that it gives lord in that we also ask for forgiveness when we don't live as a community we don't live as the people you want us to be but we listen to the world and we praise being the individual father help us to relate better help us to be community better built on the foundation of who you are father help us to be a place where we can say we pass the casserole test because we are there when people need us. Lord, we know in another place your word says we need to be able to weep with those who weep. Father, this week, may we do that. For those who are struggling, may we weep with those who weep. May we laugh with those who laugh. But above all, Lord, let us be open to walking that journey with people face to face. And we ask this today in your name. Amen. Well, again, thank you very much for joining with me today. It's great that we can catch up like like this and, and, and just unpack a bit of God's word. My encouragement, though, is remember that picture of the early church. 
that just doing it online, it really isn't the bigger picture of what God sees as church. It's not the bigger church, a bigger picture of relating and being there for each other. It's not the bigger picture of passing the casserole test. It's good for the short term, but my prayer is that all of us will get back meeting face to face very quickly. Thank you for joining with me again today. And again, remember uh, next Wednesday evening, 6.30, Facebook Live, Join us at Casino Baptist Church. And then again on Sunday, in person if you can, it'll be great if you could. Just remember, if you're a regular attender at church but can't be there for some reason, please let me or Julie know. But if you can be there, it'll be wonderful to see you next Sunday, 10 o'clock. If not, I'll see you online next week. Bye for now.